Uh, next up, we have Khadija Moon Ali Coleman. You may remember her because she's been here before and she did a wonderful job. She's talking about facing the music in the future. She's a writer and blogger at Soul Bounce, Soul, excuse me, Soul Bounce. Dot com, and she's looking toward a future. She's looking forward to the day when she can download things, whether they be off iTunes or wherever, and just have them show up in her head and just let her mute, you know, walk around with a chip in her brain that's playing the music. So I'm curious where that's going to lead us in this talk. Khadija. How's everyone doing? Okay, finish this line. Oh, Daddy D, you know you're still number one. Cause... Hey, good job. Okay. I'm a karaoke junkie, but this isn't karaoke, intellectual karaoke. I was born in the 70s and I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. So I basically grew up a music pirate. <laughs> I got music from wherever I could get it. Remember tape cassettes and the boom box? <laughs> well, what I did was I dubbed everything. And during the 80s and the 90s, before CDs, um, I bought an album or tape if I had money, but if I didn't, I just dubbed my own copy. And everyone did it. You weren't called a thief so readily back then when you dubbed music because most likely you were just a groupie or everyday fan, and being a fan wasn't criminalized as it is now. And during, <laughs> during that time, we witnessed music sales that broke rec records despite people like me who dubbed a music. And Michael Jackson, poor Michael Jackson, was still able to sell over $40 million, <laughs> I mean, 40 million records worldwide. The 80s in particular were incredible. Not only were our music options pretty broad, our accessibility to music was now up in, uh, opening in areas we hadn't had before. The Walkman was developed in 19, it came out in 1981, as was MTV launched, making videos a new avenue for record companies to market music and build audience. What was unbeknownst to many of us was that 1981 was also the birth of the CD player. So the 80s were great. <laughs> the top record companies during the 80s that kind of took over the industry, they dominated over smaller labels and started taking the industry to areas that we, weren't, we didn't go before, like hip hop. And they also started to use technology in ways that we didn't use them before. So in came the 90s and tapes became CDs and record companies continued to merge and buy out smaller companies, really dominating the industry. So before we were shelling out maybe 10 bucks for an album or, or tape, we're now paying a bit more, but we're also seeing our music on television. And th things seem really great from a distributor's point of view during the early 90s, but what many companies did not anticipate during the 90s was the internet. The open source nature of the internet began to radically transform the way in which we became familiar with music artists, <laughs> purchased music or didn't purchase music, and the in internet began to impact the nature of signing artists, marketing artists, and selling music, um, with this transition beginning to happen and lead us to where we are now, where we're going. Right now, total revenue from U.S. music sales and licensing has plunged to $6.3 billion in 2009, according to Forrester Research, a more than 60% drop since 1999. Now, just only 44% of U.S. internet users and 64% of Americans who buy digital music think that the music is worth paying for. This trend will progress. When folks decide to purchase music, the digital downloads will continue to dominate as the method people will purchase and share. But <laughs> despite what some performers, like his Purple Highness Prince believes, online savviness is essential for today's unsigned artists as well as the signed artists. And the internet has lowered the divide in that area. It's just as crucial for a label-backed artist to have an online presence as it is for an indie artist. We want to have that connection with artists, and the internet gives us that false sense of intimacy with an artist who is actively engaged online. Now, <laughs> while we won't be borrowing hair or clothes tips from her, an artist like Lady Gaga personifies a successful artist who is using the internet to not only gauge her audience, but engage her audience, leading her to become the most followed person on Twitter. She uses Twitter to promote shows, garner feedback, preface appearance, et cetera, et cetera. And while I predict that many multiple streams of income is mandatory nowadays for artists as we glide into the future, I think touring will definitely continue to usurp the importance of record sales. With artists currently leaking free tracks, selling downloads for pennies, or giving them away for free, we can expect a future that music is our eye on our iPod will be free, but the technology to get that is what we're gonna begin paying for more. 
So my prediction is simple. Music will still be around in the future, of course, but it won't look like what we saw in the 80s until now. Music and technology will have a more uniform relationship where you have to buy the technology in order to hear the music. Our relationship with our favorite acts will develop in a way that celebrity will appear more real, which will most likely mean celebrities will be investing more in social media experts as new A&R, which is basically what we're seeing now with folks hired to run Twitter accounts. So, however, um, <laughs> lastly, artists are going to have to work harder to retain their core base. And that, my folks, is my prediction for the future. Thank you.